Now let's talk about subculturing and cell banking. It's an important uh, part of uh, tissue culturing. Uh, although you may not be using uh, some of these things directly in the lab, but it is important to know these things. Cells should be subcultured just before they approach confluency. What is confluency? A confluent monolayer is an adherent cell culture in a dish, plate or a flask in which cells have formed a single layer over the entire surface available for the growth of these cells. Once the cells have started to form clusters above the first layer, which means basically cells are still dividing, there was no room available on the dish, so they started climbing upwards, so they have started forming the clusters, or if they have started to lift up from the surface, the culture is past confluency stage, Cells that have repeatedly been passaged at densities past confluency display decreased doubling times, so they are slower to divide, decreased viabilities, they start to die off, and decreased ability to attach to a substrate. So you need to passage, make sure that your cells are passaged regularly in order to keep them viable and healthy. To increase the sample, we can also subculture, so for example, we placed X amount of cells in a dish. After two or three days, you saw that from whatever number of cells you placed in the dish, now we have 10 or um, 100 times more cells. Now you can split these cells. You can take these cells, remove them from the dish. You can divide them into smaller groups, and then you can plate them again on new dishes. So that way you can increase the number of your sample. And it also keeps the cell happy. Suspension cultures, they generally should be passaged before they reach density of 2 to 2.5 million cells per ml and they should be diluted back to 0.7 to 1 million cells per ml. An average cell, as I've mentioned, can divide 50 times before it gets unhealthy. Cells, when you have to passage the cells or you, when you have to lift the cells from a Dish, we are of course talking about adherent cells. They are treated with trypsin EDTA. Trypsin, I've already mentioned, is a protease. Since a lot of these adhesion proteins are sticking outside the cells, that is one of the prime targets of the trypsin. And this trypsin is, of course, a low concentration of trypsin is used. To help trypsin do its job, we also add EDTA. EDTA is basically a chelator, it grabs and holds. Calcium ions, calcium ions, when they are stuck to EDTA, they are removed from the system. They are no longer available to the cell. And a lot of adhesion proteins basically rely on presence of calcium ion to function properly. So if there is low calcium, the adhesion proteins that make cells stick to each other or to the substrate, they stop working properly because of the absence of uh, calcium ion. So because we use EDTA, we can also lower the concentration of trypsin used, which is beneficial for the cells. Since I've mentioned earlier, trypsin is a protease and higher concentration of the cell and can damage a higher concentration of trypsin can damage our sample or the cells. Again, trypsin is highly active, relatively non-specific protease, and it should be made fresh every time. The reason trypsin is a protease Protease means, in this case, a non-specific protein that destroys protein, other protein molecules. And it so happens, trypsin itself is a protein molecule. So if you make trypsin and you uh, leave it there, the trypsin molecules will start eating each other up and ultimately you will have zero enzymatic activity left. So please make trypsin fresh whenever you want to use it. Also, uh, over-trypsinization can damage the cells, as I've mentioned. So EDTA uh, can help us in that, that regard because it will allow us to use lower concentration of trypsin. Always block uh, trypsin with serum to prevent damaging the cells. So once this, you add serum to the system, serum has a lot of proteins that will basically block the activity of trypsin and it will prevent it, trypsin from damaging your cells. So one of the things we can do with a lot of cells is we can store them. We can store them at lower temperatures in, uh, for example, liquid nitrogen, and they can last a very, very long time. So why do we want to store cells? We don't have to maintain them. If you 
have the cells in the incubator, you'll have to keep on feeding them, you'll have to keep massaging them. And of course, as we have mentioned earlier, cells, the viability of cells will also decrease if you keep on massaging them. If you store them, you can avoid all that. And additionally, you have a stock of cells that you can plate anytime you need them. Also, if you have frozen your cells, stored them, you can also transport them long distances or ship them. So in order to freeze cells, you need to add cryoprotectants in your cell mixture. The two which are basically DMSO and glycerol. Glycerol is generally used for prokaryotic or simpler cells. DMSO is more penetrating and it usually is the agent of choice for larger or more complex cells. So basically these cryoprotectants prevent ice crystals forming from forming inside the cell. We know that a cellular environment or cytoplasm is aqueous. So these will prevent uh, those crystals from forming because once they form, they can start damaging cell structures. Stem cell and tissue banking is a common practice in the West. So when there's a newborn, cells from the cord blood are taken and they're stored because these cells can be used later on, for example, for regenerative medicine. If that individual needs cells, uh, tissue replacement, for example, in future, that would be a good source of it. Unfortunately, we don't have those facilities here yet. So how do you start? Trypsinize the cells, remove the cells from the container, spin the cells, remove the trypsin, block trypsin with media plus 10% serum, spin the cells, remove the blocking media, suspend the cells and 5 to 10% DMSO plus media and 20% serum and you freeze the cells slowly in the tubes inside styrofoam rack and once they are frozen you can store these cells in liquid nitrogen for longer purposes they can stay there pretty much indefinitely another technique i would like to mention is how you can sort cells we have talked about you can have pure cultures by using restrictive media that will allow only certain cell types to survive and other cells will perish Another way to obtain pure cultures or a single type of cell cultures from a source which has many different cells in it, you can use magnetic cell sorting. Basically, the way it works, I'm going to explain it very, very briefly. All cells have specific surface proteins and people generate antibodies that can recognize specific proteins which are present, always present on a specific cell type. These antibodies, they'll bind their substrate these antibodies have another very important feature is that they're attached to a magnetic bead. So once these antibodies have bound to the cell, they will basically magnetize the cell and we can use that to our advantage. These cells are incubated with an antibody that recognizes an antigen present on the surface of the cell of interest. These antibodies are, of course, as I've mentioned, are conjugated to magnetic beads. So once that has happened, we pass our sample through a column and we place a magnet. So here's the column and here's this blue object is a magnet. So all cells which don't have that antibody attached to them will pass through and the cells that have the magnetic antibody attached to them will stay stuck somewhere in here in this region because they are attached to a magnetic bead and it will these magnets will prevent that cells from going down into this tube. Later on, you can take this column and you can wash it, remove the magnets and now when you rinse it, you will have the specific cell type that you wanted that was a cell type of your interest. So this is another very simple, very elegant way of obtaining specific type of cell that you want to study.